Okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm Shirley Wang. I'm a faculty member from Department of Leadership and Organization Management, uh, School of Economics and Management. So it's quite strange that you hear a professor from a leadership and organization management department talking about um, a little bit much macro industry development of the winter sport because that's my another identity. I, in the, during the past six years, I'm working as the director for the Center of Sports Industry Development in Tsinghua University. So six years ago, let's go back to six years ago, that's 2015. So this year, you already know, we successfully bid for the host of 2022 Winter Olympics. That's Beijing and Zhang Jiakou will together hold these events. So starts at the very beginning of our center, winter sports industry is one of our major topics and focus to watch, to look, and to doing some research in this area. So tonight, I hope I can give you a brief introduction of the winter sports industry development past in China during the past six years, and what we are going to looking forward to after Olympic Winter Olympics of you know starting from next year, how it will going you know forward to the targets. So let's do a very quick questions when we're talking. Uh, winter sports industry. So globally say sports industry is a very large industry. But if we're talking about the different games, which game you think taking the largest part of the sports industry, globally speaking? Which game? Soccer, football, right. It's not the winter sports industry, it's the football industry. Globally speaking, taking the largest percentage of the sports industry. But in different countries, especially in some European countries, winter sports industry is taking a larger, larger percentage of that business. And in China, during the last you know, past six years, there are only two games, or two kinds of sports has gained the national attention and also from the government exercise and also from the mass population, you know, their interest. One is the football and the other one is the winter sports. So today we are talking about the winter sports industry. And I'm going to talk in, why? So the first one, uh, I'm going to talk five different topics. First one is an overview of the China you know, winter sports industry, uh, you know, develop. And the second one, we hope to tell you some policies. Uh, it's a national policy to develop, uh, okay. So policies to promoting the winter sports industry. And then the third and fourth part, we will talk mainly about two biggest sector, or uh, two major sector of sports industry. One is manufacturer sector, the other is service sector, and the last, now least we are looking forward to the future. So the first one, let's overview of this industry. Just you know, remind you today we, we probably present a large amount of numbers, different numbers regarding the size, the consumers about this industry. So there are many charts there. So the first one, when we're looking at a sports industry, so if we're looking at from the perspective of industry chain, we can say upstream, middle stream and downstream. So you're looking at the winter sports, you can see here, we had the upstream, the venue planning and the designing. Remember, the professor Zhang Li has given us you know, two fabulous seminars on how he designed the winter sports Olympics venues. So that's the upstream ones. And then there are also equipment production, research and development, uh, no matter it's the venue for the venue operation use or for the individual people use. And then the middle stream. So we see a lot of things regarding with the service sector. So the venue operation, and there are some, you know, about the events, competition, training, tourism. And to the downstream, we can see here, is about the distribution and the marketing of this sports, winter sports industry. Of course, finally, it's come to our consumers. So that's the perspective from the industry chain to see this sports industry. And then we can also see why. 
also see from what we say, basically from the three key components of the spot. So when we're talking about the three key components of the spot, here is people and organization, venue and the facilities and equipment, and the other one is the games and the competition. So when we're talking about the sports, if you have these three basic elements, we can say the sports can be developed into a industry. So when we're talking about the winter sports industry, we also can see the industry from the venue part, from the people part, consumer part, or player part, as well as from the game part. So that's why we divided tonight's lectures. So here coming the first chart. And we, everybody knows that due to the pandemic, you know, starting from year 2020, so the winter season or the snow season for most of the ski resort in China has to be closed. So we see the number dropped in year 2020. But if we see the growth rate, we can see that's a very large industry sector. In terms of the number of the money you know, generated, the product output generated in this industry, in year 2019 is almost more than 520 billion RMB. And if we see the growth rate of our people's income that the forecasting for the future, we can confidently to say we will reach this number in year by the year 2025. And you know what that means? That means a trillion business. And also this number will take part, you know, 20% of the whole sports industry of China. So winter sports industry, single, we, we, we would not say single game, but this side of game will take part about one fifth of the whole sports industry of China by the end of 2025. So that's really a big thing. So this is the numbers of the forecasting and so far the whole industry side. And here is the number of the ski resort as well as the people who involve or participate in the ski. And it's only for ski, it's not for ice skating. <coughs> so here we can see the number of the ski skiers also reached the highest one in year 2019. So it's above, we can see, it's about 20 million people already. You know, that's in single year, we have about 20, more than 20 million people ski. And in year 2020, so it's dropped to more than 12 million. But if we, we, if we see the 12 million, it's already a large number, especially for the, uh, our colleagues from the European countries, they see that's still a large market. They are going to you know, pursue in that way. So that's the numbers of the ski resorts as well as the skiers. And we can see here, have you ever been to those ski resorts before? That's coming from uh, ranking uh, in terms of five criteria. Uh, that's usually is our consumers much emphasize on. For example, here, the sliding track, the community activities, and your user's evaluation and the general attractiveness. And here we can see that's the top 10. And I think most of you know this top 10, most of them are located in Jilin province. Uh, we see Bei Da Hu, we see Song Hua Hu. We also can see most of them, those top 10 are located in Hebei province as well as Beijing area. So we see those ski resorts. There are only, we say two of them are not belong to this area. One is the Silk Road that's located in Xinjiang and this one is in, located in Heilongjiang province. So there is a, another quick question. Do you know the soiest ski resort in China? The soiest, sauce, sauce it. That means it's very, actually we don't think, for most people they don't think they will have ski resort before, but nowadays they, they have the ski resort and operate very successfully. Which province? It's not in the northeast. Guess, take, take a guess. Anybody knows, have been there? Is there any students coming from Guizhou province? No, so in Guizhou province, in Liu Pan Shui, we have the soiest ski resort. It's outdoor, 
It's not the indoor, it's the outdoor ski resort in that province. And it operates profitably. It's very good operation and the good operations there. So I hope they and by, you know, after the Olympics, you can go in there. And there is a, a joke that it's not a joke, it's actually is what happening now. But due to the pandemic, I think some of the objective cannot be reached. Because this year, we, we know the coming Winter Olympic Games is just around the corner. So the Jilin province has a very brief focus that since all the venues will be occupied by the Olympic players, so they will, their venues, their ski restaurant will welcome the nationwide skiers to their location. So they had the largest promotion campaign just starts one month ago. So hope to attract more the, you know, the national wide skiers go to Jilin province instead of you know, Hebei, Chongli, because we have the Olympic Games there. So that's the ski restaurant. And not only the outdoor, we can see also the generally our official statistics, the increase of those venues increased very significant in the past five years. And you can see from here, we in year 2015, we have 500 ski resorts. And by the end of last year, we have seven and four and one ski resort already. It's almost reached the goal, 800 ski resort. <coughs> and for the ice rinking, Hua Bing Chang, ice rinking, ice rinks. And we start from very small number, 200. And you can see by the end of, of 2019, we are already above the targets for the 2022. Now we have 1,187 ice rinks nationwide. So it's very high speed. And we think that will keep you know, growing in the future. And besides the outdoor, ski resort. I hope, I think some of you uh, has the experience to, you know, enjoy playing in the indoor ski resort. So most of the indoor ski resort in China owned by a company, Rongchuang, uh, Rongchuang Group. So starting from five in 2013, nowadays we have 36 indoor ski resort nationwide. And if you see the global ranking, of the indoor ski ride, so in terms of the snow area, and in the among the top 10, five of them are in China, and all owned by Rongchuang and operated by Rongchuang. So if you are in Guangzhou, you know, Guangzhou city, we, don't, we couldn't have outdoor ski resort due to the climate, but you can go to the indoor ski resort. And the largest one is quite strange, it's located in Harbin. So we heard that people here say, if we want to ski, we, want, we don't want to go indoor because we have the plenty of place of outdoor ski resort. But that's the largest one and very advanced you know, equipment and technology applied in the operation of that resort. So that's for the venue, <coughs> the venue part. And now let's see this one. How you figure out this one? I think as uh, students of Tsinghua University, uh, just probably one year later, you have another thing to be proud, you know, among the college students in China because our university, university has one, what we call North Stream. And it's what? It's <laughs> will develop the skating, the ice hockey, ice hockey and other ice sports on campus. And most amazingly, you can see it will open all year round. So for the students of Tsinghua University, we could have this advantage to skating, to ice hockey, you know, on the campus without going outside the campus. So that's the North Stream of Tsinghua. It's under construction. I see every day I going by, you know, along the building, I see it's near finish, near accomplishment of this dream. And here, that's the venue part. Now let's come into the people part, the consumer. So who is the winter sports consumer? And of course, answer is you, it's you. Because from the technology or techniques part of this sports, as well as the sports require brave, require a lot of skills, body skills. So the youth ones, the youngest people are usually the major player in this sports. But of course, they are still, you know, 
old ones, but they start their practicing from very small age you know, from the child. So we can see here the penetration rate uh, of the skin in major population or in major countries in the whole population of world, around the world. We can see Switzerland has 35% of their population who involved in winter sports. That's a very large number, Switzerland. And in China, here we have, so far we have 1%. So that's already represent a very large number of population. But compare with the penetration rate of the major countries you know, in the world, we, we could see that's a still a long way to go to develop this population, sports population. And most of those, our skiers, are beginners. So here from a survey, you can see 70% of our skill, skiers are the beginners. So they are not the experienced ones, they are not the advanced ones. We know there are several advanced people, a group of that, but most of our skiers are beginners. That's also the fact that we start our winter sports very lately. It's not like you know, football, basketball, uh, even you know, swimming, <coughs> running, those kind of sports we start from very early and also is developed and populated in China for such a long time. But winter sports is just the beginning. And here is the age. age. You can see a very uh, unique index is called TGI. TGI means here is how the TGI uh, calculated. That's the proportion of the people in this age group who involved in winter sports uh, comparably with the age group in the whole population. So if it's more than 100, that means this age group has more people played in this sports. So we can see where is the one more than 100 group here. So it's below uh, 24 years old. So it's starting from six until 24, that's taking a very large uh, group. So if you are li under 24, you have s still have several years. You can learn the winter sports. You know, skating, skiing uh, is quite fancy and very interesting sports. And also from the geographical, from the city here, especially the largest cities, the most advanced cities in China has the largest number of the winter sports players, uh, especially Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. So when we say Shenzhen, uh, for example, the ice hockey <coughs> players. We had the people, the teams from Shenzhen, and those teenagers play very good, very good. They start their training from their, even from their uh, primary school. So uh, in the first tier <coughs> cities, or especially super cities, those younger people are the main customer of this business. And also this customer has what the profile of this customer, high income. So most of the consumers uh, earn more than 10,000 RMB per, per month. So we see more than one third in that part. And that's for the national, that, I mean the national, the, the whole country number. So there are about near half of them are below, you know, in this area, 5,000 to 10,000 per month. Uh, so their consumption ability compared with the whole internet users is much higher. So high income, and willing to spend money, not only on winter sports, willing to spend money. So that's the profile for this group of consumer. And here for our youth consumers, that's what we have done one month ago about the China youth uh, participation in the winter sports survey. And we can see, uh, we confirmed several observations before from the other institutes or organization that most of our winter and sports players or uh, participators are the beginners. You can see most of the 80, more than 80% of the ice sports participator take only one to five times per year. And for the snow sports participators, one to five days per year, also taking about more than 62%. But comparably, ice and sports, you can see for the snow, uh, ice and snow sports, you can see snow sports players has much more stickiness to this sports compared with the ice sports participator. And also where do they, 
play, take part in that. So uh, for the students in Beijing, Shanghai, and you can see, you see the answers of the respondents is quite fitting your common sense. Most of the players for the ice sports, they are play to, you know, play these sports in the ice rinks located in the commercial center, uh, commercial center. So that's a uh, very, you know, shopping malls and there is uh, ice rinks and people go in there spending the day and, you know, participates in the ice. And for the snow participator, most of their location, you know, to take part in this sports is the outdoor ski resort. And a little bit, you know, less in a more than indoor ski resort. But for the ski stimulator, simulators, is very few percentage of the players will use that. But most of them are coming from the southern province of China. And that's the first part. So we are talking about how the the overview of the whole industry from the people, from the venue. And here is some policy part. In China, I say winter sports, this game or industry has gained much more attention compared with the other sports, you know, no less than football industry, but compared with other sports, gain much more attention. We can see there are a lot of national policies has been developed and implemented in the last five years. So we just give give you, a, you know, just a quick view of that. Please see those here, who announced those policies. We, we, we see the general administration of sports of China. So that's usually we think, okay, winter sports industry should be coming from the general administration of sports. But most of the policy are not from, only from this G, general administration of sports. It's from the state council. It's from the other, ministries uh, such as the Development and Reform Commission and the other ministries that they are working together try to develop winter sports in the youth group in the you know the mass population so that's the very important national policies and also we can see their specialized policies regarding the ice and the snow equipment that's coming from the uh, ministry, ministry, uh, ministry of Industrial and uh, Communication, uh, and also we can see here that's the winter sports events and also ice and snow tourism. There are very special uh, policies regarding this specific sector for this industry. So we see they gain a lot of attention from the government. And also here, most of those policies regarded with two things, just as I mentioned. One is the venue, the other one is the people. So most of those policies are focused on, or emphasize on the, let me see, the innovative the operation of the venues. Existing venues are build new ones. And also they support the construction and the reconstruction of those multinational, uh, multifunctional venues. For example, to light those ice sports, you know, winter sports going into the campus, the schools, going to the scenery, going to the community, uh, there are several policies there, as well as talent development. So here we can see a set of policies to car you know, car uh, encourage the universities to set up certain winter sports major or related major and to set up winter sports training centers as well as the research center. That's why you heard from Professor Wending uh, last session, last last session about how the advanced technology of Tsinghua University has been applied to help our national team to prepare for the coming game. And here we also can see to develop teenagers' winter sports skills. So there's a lot of policies try to make the teenagers, the younger ones, to learn how to you know, ski, how to skate. And that's a very national strategy because everybody knows 300 million people on ice and the snow. 300 million people on ice and the snow. For those elder ones, for those age population, that's impossible. It cannot say, you know, stand on the ice and the snow, but they can enjoy the tourism to sightseeing, to see their grandson or their son daughters, to ski or skating. That's that's fine. But for most of the 
part of that objectives we need to younger ones to involve in that ones. So that's for the policy parts. And the third and fourth, I will talk a little bit more in detail about the manufacturer sector as well as the service sector in this winter sports. And for the manufacturer sector, it's not a good story at the very first beginning. I remember our center has a co-organized seminar with the Finland, with the country, European country Finland. When we, we worked together on this seminar and they told us that they had the highest out of most of the advanced winter sports technology has been applied to what, 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 why news events, that's a set of big rooms names. So I'm thinking of that. So when we build that up our venues, our own venues, is that means we can apply our own technology? But the answer is no. So here you can see there are some major you know, venues for the ski resorts in China. Here is the ice skating rinks in China, a different area. It's in Hangzhou, in Beijing, in Suzhou. Here is you know, Hebei, uh, Jilin as well as Sichuan. There are so many ski resorts. And if you see their equipments, their machines, their applied you know, equipments and their technology using in that venues, you see all those are foreign brand. Means that's why, not because we admire foreign brand, because they are really good. They are really good. Because they develop their technology starting from late 18th century or early 19th century. But we just know these sports from 20s. I mean, not mean, I mean, ancient ice and snow culture. That's not contradiction to what Cui Lequan, uh, Professor Cui Lequan mentioned last session. Because we know this industry, we know those modern machines very a few, you know, few years ago. So you see those equipment coming from Italy, and that's a very brand, you know, famous brand for the what we call the skinny, the ice strengthening and ice trimming machine is from Angle, that's from Italy. And also from Holland, uh, they're also from Austria, they're also from United States, they're also from you know, Canada. So most of those equipment are coming from the foreign country because they're, they really has the cutting edge technologies. And I don't know whether you know those those machines, what this is making snow. You can see usually it's about 30 to 5, 50 machines running on the ski resort. They're making the snow. That's we already know, magic carpet. And here is the, the snow, <coughs> snow, uh, snow car, what we call the snow car. And this is the cable. Uh, cable. So if you compare their profits and uh, compare with the price, you can, we can see the difference and the profit margin. So the China, the Chinese manufacturers, uh, those manufacturers have tried to make a decision whether we should uh, put in money, put in efforts in research and development to develop our own brand equipment. I would say they make a great achievement in the last two or three years. Probably we cannot see, I would, would so absolutely, but we cannot see some local brand in the coming Olympic Games because there are very strict rules about what kind of machine, what kind of equipment can be used on the Olympic venues. But we already seen some local brand machines and equipment has been installed in the other venue, <coughs> ski resorts or the rice, you know, ice rinks. So that's a good signal. And we also can see certain ones, the localization of the those equipment and the machines are already about you know, 90%. So that means we can make it by ourselves. And when we talk with the manufacturers in this industry, why you didn't, or why you don't you know, uh, put in much more R&D efforts in this sector, the answer always be, what the prediction of the needs, the demands of the machine in China in the future? That's a very important question because for the companies, money making the profits is still is one of their objectives. So if you tell me that there are only 500 ski resorts and most of them already installed those kind of machines and equipments, 
And I think the company will feel we don't have much more market in the future. So why we putting our resources in developing those products? But nowadays, since this sports is growing, more than people involved or participate in this sports. So the company see the future, see the business opportunities there. That's also another drive of this sector development. And this, this is one journal, one comment that I just published two or three, two or three days ago, right, in the Renmin Daily. It's about how the ice and the sport and the ice and the snow equipment industry develop. It's triggered by our Olympics game, but it developed in the past several years. And now we can see some future, see the perspective, but still a long way to go. And that's for the Another one in China we see, I think you already see some of them in the commercial center or in the shopping mall. You can see some of the demonstration there. And we apply technology, especially internet uh, technology, on into this winter sports industry. So here, those famous, everybody are popular technologies you can plus with winter sports equipment. For example, here is the VR ski simulator. So it has been located in certain, even some, some schools. And here is the VR uh, sled. And there is 3D ski simulator and the skating robots. But on the other hand, we have the internet platform. That means the ice and the snow travelers. And they have very convenient way to book their activities, to book the hotel, to book the uh, ski resorts, you know, those activities, competitions, even, you know, buy the tickets on the online. So each ski resort has their own, um, I would say, accounts on the WeChat. So they can sell in the tickets uh, through their own accounts. There are a lot of internet, uh, internet technology applied in the distributing and the marketing of the ski resort. So we can see a number here for the ice and snow users. Nowadays, they book their relatively activities online is take about 70%. So it's quite convenient to communicate with your consumers. That's why we have those ski resorts ranking uh, a few slides away. And for the service part, <coughs> service sector of this winter sports industry, I will talk three of them. One is the competition and the game, and the second is the training part, and the third one is about the travel, the ice and the snow tourism. So let's start with the game and the competition <coughs> here. So since our successfully bid of the 2022 Winter Olympics, the number of the ice and snow events in China has been increased significantly. If we come looking back to year 2013, and so far we already doubled that number in the past eight years, or we say actually it's only seven years, but we already doubled uh, those number of the events. And for Chongli, we can see from that season, 2018 to 2019 season, Chongli area has held five international A-level competition. That's the highest ones, you know, compared, you know, be just below the Winter Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics. So they already have those international competitions there. Besides those ones, <coughs> we also have some mass competition. That means it's age, you know, to the Ordinary people is now the elite isolate in the winter sports. So we can see those kind of competition. And here is the percentage um, of different competition gained the attention from our people, from Chinese people. And still, the international large scale comprehensive tournament still gained the largest one, 32%. And followed by the international specified event then in different game. And then we see here, that's our domestic special events. So I don't know whether you know some elite athletes of China national team who is you know, for, uh, very good at one single uh, winter sports, such as Gu Ailing. I think you know that girl name, right? He, he just made, she just made a history that's very uh, fantastic. That move is so wow. So, but that, that we know. And we also know there are several games that China national team has a little bit, we say, advantage. Uh, there are some uh, U-shape um, games there. 
So we see people like to see those specialized events. Of course, figure skating, figure skating. And I heard from some college students that if we, we can be the volunteers in the figure skating gym, the venue, that would be a very good thing. I heard from other universities, you know, students who are going to take the volunteer jobs in the coming game. I, but I know it's not from our Tsinghua University. But they said that's very beautiful. That's so, you know, fantastic. I think that's because it's really very beautiful game. So people love to see that. So that's from the attention part. <coughs> Here also, uh, ice curling. And China has been once, you know, the world champion in this game. And if we're looking at the competition from the economic perspective, I don't know whether you know uh, the cost and the income of the ice and the snow or winter sports competition. If we see the cost, it's quite simple. One third, one third, one third. That's only you know, three parts of the cost, and 40% is coming to the events management. And the other two 30% is going to the venue rentals and the copyright fees separately. So that means the cost is quite simple. The cost structure is quite simple. That's three part taking all the costs that you need to consider when you organize a competition, winter sports competition. But when you see the income side, you, can, you cannot see a very balanced structure of the income, the very revenue part. And most of the income coming from the broadcasting fees, uh, broadcasting fees. And the other one is coming from the commercial sponsorship. And only 10% for the winter sports competition, the income is coming from what we are usually thinking about the ticket selling, the souvenir selling, it's only about 10%. So if you want to make money when you held a winter sports competition, so you need to manage to have much more you know, broadcasting income as well as your commercial, you know, sponsorship, commercial sponsorship. So that's the cost and the income of the winter sports competition. And here, this one is organized by Guan Sports. And they organized this very uh, series of the competition, ski competition for teenagers. They got the copyright from the National Winter Sports Center. Uh, that means Dongji Yinlong Zhong Xin. They got the copyright. They had the authority, you know, they got the copyright, they can organize this one. So they organized several stops in China. Before the pand pandemics, they, this competition has become very popular in those of the advanced teenager skiers. And usually the family will go together. And the competition is looking so booming, I would say, a uh, much more bright perspective in the future considering the commercial part as well as the educational part of that competition. So that's the most one. And besides the computation, uh, competition, have you anybody see a performance, not I mean, not from China, but you can see the performance on TV. It's called Magic on Ice, uh, something like that. That's some um, the professional elite athletes, figure skatings, uh, skaters. They will perform, uh, you know, the dance, the music. Not so high level difficulties, but much more, you know, experience and the arts demonstration parts. And in China. Uh, I think most of you can recognize this couple's face. They are the world championship, Pang Qing and Tong Jian. They start their own training uh, center for the you know, figure skating, uh, the younger ones. But they also start their own performance like Magic on Ice. And they have this Magic on Ice. Their version has been performed in China, uh, in Beijing, as well in Shanghai. And not only this couple, this, you know, they perform themselves, but there are some, a, a set of people, uh, some of coming from the elite athletes, but some of them are coming from the younger, you know, the kids, the teenagers, they also can perform on ice. A very beautiful performance. So for the ice part, we also can see this. It's not a competition, but it's kind of performance. And for the training part, and I don't know, because for most of the people, for me, at my age, if you tell me, please, uh, to learn how to ski, for me, I feel so terrified. 
because I'm a teacher, I need to standing in the classroom to giving courses to my students. But if I broke my leg, like, it's so it's not convenient. So I will feel very, very terrified and very reserved to learn these skills. But for the younger ones, <coughs> the learning of those, you know, ice and snow games, the the the, the skills to you know skating or ski is the very first start of their you know, interaction with the sports. So the training is a really a big business in winter sports industry. And I don't know whether you have the estimation of for the ice hockey, for the kids to learn how to play ice hockey, how much they, the family will spend on these kids per year, especially in the large cities that's in terms of the numbers, it's not only 45, 40 or 50,000 RMB per year. Sometimes it will go up to 100,000 per year. So that's a very cost. I would say a large cost, cost for the family. But if the kids like, usually the parents would like to pay for that. So we see the, 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 the cost for the training institution and also the consumers. But they are still a long way to go because here most of the kids start to learn you know the ice hockey figure skating and the ski but not so many younger ones to learn how to ice curling that means bing hu or uh, speed skating uh, is no but the figures figure skating the ski and ice hockey that's three is the po most popular winter sports games that nowadays China Chinese kids or children love to learn. And here you can see the trainings. And surprisingly to see, even for those you know, skating and the figure skating training, now we have great. Have you anybody familiar with that? For piano, we have 10 grade, right? But now for figure skating, we also have great. So for the kids, they will learn for certain times and then they will take in the exams to pass the exam and upgrading, upgrading. So that's another story, it's a very familiar story. But why we have grading the kids? Because they need some improvement or signal or certificate to show their improvement. So the figure skating uh, grade requirement it has just been announced this year. Uh, and, uh, one year ago, but the skate, uh, the speed skating is announced this year. So everybody, uh, especially for the kids, they will look at those skating uh, grade requirement, and then their coaches will tell them, you are ready, so you can take the exams. So that's a very familiar picture, instead of, you know, it's not the, the arts training, but in the sports training. And also another kind of training, <coughs> have you seen those things in Tsinghua University? I think our university has very good equipment and also facilities. But for most of the schools in south part of China, uh, without, without you know, ski resort or the ice rinkings nearby. So they also want to let the students to know how to play winter sports. So here we have something like with the dry land things. So here you can see the dry land roller skating. And why like the kids to play roller skating? Because from roller skating to ice skating. Uh, we had a special term for that, lun zhuan bi. And the other one here, the dry land curling. So you don't need the ice, but you can still practice the curling. It's the same, you know, the rules with the ice curling. So if you have the opportunity, probably you, you know the rules that you can start. Play. And here is the grass skiing. So you don't ski on the snow, but you can ski on the grass. So that's the special, you know, very special training. And for the ice and the snow tourists, that's also a large sector, sector in this industry. And, but of course, due to the pandemics, we can see very sharp draw downsides here, but it's already in the recovery process and we are forecasting uh, we'll have a large more percentage of the whole winter sports industry in the future because for the ice and the snow travel that's 
you, you usually you spend a lot of money in terms of you know, transportation, hospi hotel stay, and also tickets and the drinking and the, those kind of things. So you plus a lot of consumption here. And due to the COVID-19, and if you look at, look at the year of year 2020, and most of the, play, the travelers are choose the local uh, as the local destination here. So that's another one is about the regional cooperation. That's a national strategy. So here I just copy the whole strategy is to cooperate between Jilin province, Changbai mountain, and Xinjiang, uh, that's the Altai mountain, and between these two areas. And it's a national here. It's the national experimental zone for high quality development of ice and snow economy. It's also be put into the fourth five-year plan that's just announced one month ago. So that's a very important because these two area regions has the what we say rich natural resources in ice and snow. And there are something about open islands. Uh, they can share, cooperate of their marketing. They can uh, providing some travel package, you know, among these two uh, regions. So we can see a lot of promotion campaigns nowadays already putting <coughs> into practice between these two areas. So if you like to see Xinjiang, probably one of the destination could be some, you know, snow resorts or ski resorts. <coughs> and in the future, for the future, uh, I think there are still so many, you know, challenges for this industry to develop. The first one in nowadays, we already see that we have more than 700 ski resorts nationwide nowadays. But uh, fall season, obviously, all year round the operation of the ski resort is still remain a question because <laughs> we all know ski is in winter. It's in winter. So most of the ski resorts only can gain, you know, get generated revenues among four to five months or th even three to five months. So for the other time, what they can do? So here we have some what we call the uh, yunying. that means the operation throughout the whole years. But there's still a lot of issues remain because for the summer travelers, they are not scarce. What kind of service, what kind of travel package, what kind of products you can provide to those people who are not skiers for the ski resort, they don't have the experience. And even for the winter part, we see a lot of cases among those ski resorts, they located in the same area, but different resorts, you know, own different sliding tracks. So people are talking about this one. So you probably, you can, have the internal multi-point linkage. That means you can sliding down or skinning down from this one and then you go to the other one. So that means you can stay in this area for several you know, more days. But that means the ski resort had to cooperate together. They had the package. They know how to distribute the money generated from these tickets. But now the per cooperation among different owners and the operators of ski resort. So it means the people coming here can only ski in single ones. And if you go the other resort, you have to book the hotel again, and the ski, and get the tickets again. So it's not a good customer experience. But still, so far, the poor operation, cooperation among them. <coughs> and the second one is the talents. And here we can see a lot of things. For the college students, probably those professions are not one of your consideration. Um, Probably people say that's for the techniques, for tech, you know, technical stuff. But we can see still there is a lack of the talents, not only in technology, but also in management stuff in this industry. So we, we see the uh, professions in skill venues will be, the demand for these professions will be 1.4 times compared with 2017. But there are so few comprehensive universities providing this kind of training and education. And even they providing certain programs. They're most of them are located in Northeast of China or Hebei and Beijing. Um, so it's not everywhere. 
but it makes sense because when you have this program, you hope to have students can internship or find a job nearby in the ski resort. So the natural resources still is a issue here. It's not you know operated. And here is a very interesting question when we're doing the survey on the China youth a month ago. We asked them what is the greatest impact of the Beijing P Beijing Winter Olympic Games on you? And here what we got the answers. The first one, the largest one is, I know more about winter sports. Nearly half of the respondents say when the Beijing Olympic Winter Games is going to, you know, to help here, I know more about the winter sports. So that's a good number here. Then we see the second, in second place is here, I start to consider playing winter sports. You remember, consider. It's not actually taking part in that sport. But when you come to the third one, I played winter sports. The percentage of those respondents dropped significantly. Even when we see this, I systematically learn the skill of winter sports, or I play sports more frequently. The number is small, very small. That means what? That means our Chinese youth only think about it or know about it because the winter sports has really very high technique barrier. So for the, even for the people who are interested in this sport, they, if they want to play this, they have to learn, they have to spend money, spend the time, especially time, transportation time, your time on the ski resort, those kind of things. So you need to put a lot of efforts compared with playing other sports. So for the people really participate in this sports, that's a not an easy thing. That's a very, really very major decision if you try to think about what kind of sports you want to play during your leisure time. So here, what we have done, and that's a good news because yesterday is 100 days counting down for the coming Winter Olympic Games. And also yesterday, our courses, online courses that's developed by our center two years ago has been you know, online on the xueshi.com. And here so far we already have 24,000 you know, people has enrolled in that open course. And that open online course, what it talk about? It talk about how to enjoy the winter sports games. It's how to get to look, great look and a great understanding of those winter sports or Olympic sports that's coming, you know, games coming two months later. So that's one comparatively is also this part. I'm really know about the winter sports. And so there are some actions taken by the companies or by the practice world. They want the younger ones, and younger generations, know how to play this winter sports. So be, pay attention to those ski resorts. In the past two years, all those ski resorts have specifically given so many promotion policies to the college students, and one of those most favorable promotion. It's not the free tickets. Here you can see we, we just named some of the examples. But most of the favorable promotion efforts is to providing coach to the beginners. So if you are the first comer to this ski resort, usually you have to pay certain money to get a coach to teach you. But now they will including that coach, the coach fees into the included in the ski in the tickets fee. And usually the TK fee is free for college students. So why are they doing that? Because they want to change those first time comer, you know, first comers becoming learners of the skis or even the future, you know, frequent comers of this ski resource. So that's also try to solve the problem of the techniques barriers, like more people on this. And here is a one month ago, the 14th five year plan for the sports, and not sports business, for sports, not sports industry, for the whole sports has been announced. And we can see winter sports still gain a lot of exercise in that national plan. There is a very specific sector or section talking about how to promote winter sports industry <coughs> in the next five years. So here are some major 
actions that uh, China will take um, you know, into place in the coming five years. Here, we already know the cooperation between different area regions. And here is the sports, the winter sports you know, industry distribution in the China. So here we can see the machine manufacturer is mostly located in Northeast or North China. And for those uh, research and development equipment manufacturer, most of them are located in the Changjiang or Yangtze River Delta, Pearl River Delta, as well as the West Bank of the Taiwan Strait. And for the ice, um, ice and snow tourism, is more located in the Northeast and the North China. So there are some, the whole national, uh, we say, the layout for the industry sectors that's on our country, in our country. And also there are some events. So when you're coming back to your hometown, no matter it's in North or South of China, I think you will see more of those kind of things like uh, National Mass Winter Sports Happy Week will be organized in your hometown just to attract the, you know, the people uh, you know, to know these sports or try to experience or try some sports. I think this kind of events will be more and more in the future. And uh, here, I think about the volunteers who is sitting in this glass classroom, you are very familiar with this motto. It's called Together for a Shared Future. And for me, if you ask me what the future of the winter sports industry in China, I would say, I would say here. Have you seen this chat? Okay, so that's an 11 months baby boy. Uh, I think that's the 11 months baby boy. He cannot walk, even stand is not steadily. But he go to that ski resort, he go with his parents. His parents is try to learn the ski. And if you see there is a dog on the track, so that's what I see the future. It doesn't mean the, the boy could be the elite, you know, elite athletes, uh, skiers for China national team in the future. I think for the winter sports industry, the future is lies in everybody enjoy the game, the family enjoy the game, and we enjoy the game, what the game brings us. It's not only the performance of the, you know, everybody, but the joy, the together, and to overcome those difficulties on this, you know, the very slippery and snow tracks. So I think that's the future. If everybody loves this sports, they probably participate in the sports. They participate in the sports, and the money spent in this sports could generate a large revenues for the industry. So thank you for your attention, and especially thank all those volunteers who are going to, you know, to providing service for the coming game, because I think you are also the future for the winter sports and also for the winter sports industry. Hope several years later you can, you know, lead your child or kids going on that, you know, ski resort to play together. I think that's another life. Also what we say, the beautiful life of Chinese people in the future. Thank you.